To, um, three, come on, turn me up. Hopefully, integrity is going to work. I've got this new microphone that's hopefully working. I don't know. Um, so, you guys are recording. But last time we got through a flutter, and I probably confused a lot of you about the anticoagulation or uh, cardioversion. But I'll talk more about it today when we talk about um, a fish. So, um, we'll be able to, I'll be able to maybe make that more clear to you what that means. Um, are there any questions from last time? Crystal clear. Right. Right. Okay. All right. So you reviewed um, this already, but a, a, a fib is similar to a flutter. Um, it has a, a similar problem. Um, which I'll talk about in a second. But with, with AFib, it's 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 not as distinguishable as a flutter. It's it's um, irregular. Number one, a flutter is often regular, um, but AFib is is usually irregular. So you see this here, right? So these these waveform, these QRS complexes are uh, in different different distances from from each other. So another thing that is unique about AFib is that you cannot identify the P waves. It just looks like a bunch of junk. You can't really tell what's going on with these P waves, and um, so that's why we call it a fib. What's happening is that the atria are fibrillating. They're just kind of quivering. They're not really doing much at all. Um, so, like I said, we said with a, a flutter, you can have a, an atrial rate of what, two to three hundred. With this as well, it's going to be really high. Because here you just cannot decide what is what, right? Maybe that's a T wave, but what, what's going on here? You know, there's nothing definitive. It looks very jagged, very uninterpretive, unable to be interpreted, right? Sometimes with AFib, um, the rate can be normal, but a lot of times you'll have an increased rate, and sometimes we call that RVR. So AFib with RVR means rapid ventricular response. So um, often the rate with AFib will be high. Yes, How are you counting the atrial rate? Is that something I missed? You can't count it because you really can't identify anything, but but there's lots of P waves in there. See, that's probably P, that's a P, maybe upside down P. See, there's lots of P waves in there. So when I'm memorizing how to distinguish each one of these rhythms, I don't need to focus on the atrial rate because I can't count that? No, you, I'm never going to ask you to count the atrial rate. Um, but you, you can you can distinguish this from a flutter. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. Right. That one's the a flutter is regular. A fib is irregular. This rhythm is called it's one of the few irregularly irregular rhythms. So it, you know it, it's kind of a tongue twister. But if I put that on a test and I say the patient is in an irregular irregularly irregular rhythm, it should pop in your head probably either a fib or b fib. All right. Any questions about distinguishing that? I mean, really, you're just a fit. It's not always extremely easy to identify. Um, this this is a very nice looking a fib. It, it, you look at it, okay, that's a fib. But um, a lot of times, it's sometimes it's difficult to to look at um, and figure out. But I'll give you a classic strip. Okay. I talked about how the atria are quivering. Um, and here's some here's some causes. Um, hyperthyroidism, uh, the most common uh, dysrhythmia with hyperthyroidism is AFib, and that will come along and become more important as we go through endocrine. But remember that hyperthyroidism and AFib go together. This person is, um, if they're symptomatic, they will have signs of decreased cardiac output because they're not getting any preload, any. Um, um, volume that's coming down from the atrium to the ventricle. So we're having deficient preload. Does that make sense? A little bit of preload. So it's kind of the same as EDD and disulfide volume. 
So we're going to have some decreased cardiac output because we're not having good filling of the ventricles because the atria are not pumping the blood down into the ventricles like they're supposed to. They're just quivering, not really doing much. What does get down there usually happens mostly by gravity. Right? Of course, it, it, you know, here's your assessments, right? See if the patient is symptomatic or not. These medications can um, be used to treat uh, AFib. Uh, meds that slow down the conduction system of the heart, calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. The Joxin is also used with um, AFib because you, I think you asked, someone asked about this last time, you have a higher risk for decreased cardiac output. The Joxin increases cardiac output by doing what? <coughs> Increasing the stroke volume and decreasing the rate, right? So this, this medication will work in two ways, by decreasing the rate and by increasing the stroke volume to help get cardiac output here. Maybe to get to a regular rhythm by slowing it and also um, increasing the cardiac output. Uh, amiodarone is, a, is an anti-dysrhythmic cardioversion, shocking the patient. We'll talk more about exactly what cardioversion is later. <clears throat> and um, we, we uh, last time mentioned this anticoagulation thing because in a fib, the patient is at an even higher risk of developing clots in the atria than a flutter. So this patient if we cannot get them out of AFib, they need to be anticoagulated because they are at high risk for developing a clot, and that clot can dislodge, can embolize, and move. Most likely, it will go to the brain right, and cause a stroke. Is that because the blood is up in the atrium and it's just hanging there? Exactly. Yep. So because the atrium are not pumping the blood down to the ventricles, the blood is stagnating in the atrium, and it clots. Blood clots when it doesn't move. <coughs> So again, if, if the patient has new onset AFib, we know that this happened last night, the patient's been in the hospital, we can cardiovert them and hopefully get them out of AFib. But if this patient has chronic AFib or they've had long, they've had symptoms for weeks or whatnot, they should not be cardioverted because the risk of having already developed a clot in the atrium is higher. So if we, if we know that there's, it's, it's been around for only less than 48 hours, then think about cardioverting it. But any greater than two days, they're just going to anticoagulate it. Put them on meds, maybe part of them later. Okay. <clears throat> Ablation surgery, I think of this as um, a, t a procedure in which um, they go into the heart and they actually use a um, device or, or whatever that um, singes the, card the conduction nerves and, and, and what the materials in the heart that conduct electricity um, in, in hopes that we can kind of slow down that atrial involvement. A lot of times in, in AFib, like I said, with, with a flutter, is it's a re-entry uh, problem. So the SA node is firing, but that but that, that that electrical impulse is just circling around that in that ventricle in that in that atrium and not getting down to the ventricle like it's supposed to. So it's, it's a re-entry problem. It just spins around that electrical activity stays in the atrium. And sometimes it's down to AV node, because if they didn't the patient just would die, you know, because they wouldn't have any but, but anyhow, so the ablation surgery can help with the conduction problem. It's kind of scary though, because they could do too much ablation. The patient needs to take some so They sometimes do a complete ablation and then put a patient in. So. Huh? Uh, ablation? Let me say all that again. <laughs> I didn't get it. Can basically sever part of the electrical conduction system in that part of the heart that's causing the problem. So uh, but sometimes it will too much can be severed, or sometimes they will just do all of it and then just put a pacemaker in. Let the pacemaker become the All right. So that's the, those are atrial rhythms. SVT, A flutter, A fib, right? PAC is A fib. So these are considered blocks. So there's a few heart blocks that we need to talk about. When you hear the word block, that's exactly what it means. Electrical activity is being blocked for some reason. It's not getting to where it's supposed to go in the right amount of time or in the proper way. So the first degree AV block. Um, is probably the easiest block to identify. Um, it's, it looks like normal sinus rhythm, and essentially it is. 
um, because you have, it is sinus because you have a P, QRS, and, and the corresponding T. It looks very normal. Everything looks nice. The only thing that is abnormal in a first degree AV block is that the PR interval is too long. It's taken the electrical activity too long to get through the atrium. So therefore, when you measure your PR interval, the distance would be greater than 0 0.2. 0 0.2 is normal, right? But 0 0.24 is too long. That's a first degree block. This is its a regular rhythm. It looks basically like normal sinus rhythm, but your PR interval is too long. Any medication that would slow the conduction of electrical activity in the heart can cause this. Um, this patient most likely will have no symptoms. We're just going to monitor this patient. Maybe medications will be changed to uh, decrease this block if that's the cause. Um, but uh, this it could lead to further blocks. Malignant meaning not good, right? So there's a second degree block type one. There's two types of second degree blocks. Some of you may have learned in the past winky bot and bow this type. Just figure out that it's unnecessary. Uh, but this is confusing. There's second degree type one. There's second degree type two. This is second degree type one. Um, what, what this, what is happening here? This rhythm looks sinus, uh, but sometimes you may say see extra P waves. So What's happening is, is that the PR interval in this rhythm is getting longer and longer. So if we just start over here, we'll see that the, in this first QRS complex on the strip, that's a normal PR interval. This one's, see how it's gotten longer? This one's even longer. And then this was it. Nothing happened. It got so long, it took so long to, eventually it took so long to get there, it never even got to the AB node. So there was no QRS. You see that? We're missing a QRS. Call this one going, going, gone. After it drops one, does it like It restarts. Then it just like drops it restarts with another P wave. Sequence. And then does it follow the exact same sequence again? Sometimes the patient will drop every third beat. <clears throat> yep. So if you, if you notice, um, the P waves are regular, so if you were actually to go in and measure the distance between each P wave, it's going to be the same distance between each one. But the QRS is what's irregular, because you dropped one, so it looks irregular. Um, this rhythm is, is a little bit worse than a first degree block, but generally the patient's not going to have a lot of symptoms, because they're still having enough ventricular contractions to produce enough cardiac output uh, to maintain good mental status and normal perfusion. Um, but this can progress to a second degree type 2, or it can progress to a complete or a third degree heart block, but unlikely. So this is a second degree type 2 block. Generally, you'll have twice as many P waves as you do QRSs. And what that means is, usually, every other beat is being dropped. So if your atrial rate is 60, which is normal, right? Mm -hmm. Your QRS or your ventricular rate would be what? 30, which is quite abnormal. Right, which one counts? The ventricular rate. When I look at this, I would think that that might be a U and this is Brady, a sinus Brady. Why wouldn't that, in this, where it's dropped the QRS, that looks right. like a four, yeah, that that's, might be a U. That's a good point. But, um, I'm, yeah, I'm not going to try to trick you with two different rhythms on the strip. Okay. Yeah. But, if, but if you look closely at it, you have a P, QRS, P, nothing. P, how do I know that's not P, a U no. instead of a P? Well, technically it could be. I know. Right. I see it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but a U wave is not going to be identical to the P wave. 
Remember, all P waves look the same, should look the same. See, these, these P waves are identical. A U wave is going to be barely discernible. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to ask you to identify a U wave. Most people don't have U waves. Yeah. I mean, hopefully most people don't have this either. Right. <laughs> but, um, but U waves are very uncommon. Yeah, that was just an FYI. But, but yeah, that was a good question. But but remember that that P wave, all P waves look alike. Should look all alike. And see, so these look. Like, this look you're nice. gonna you're probably gonna get frustrated with me this semester because I never will say all of those. Oh, never yeah. and always don't count. But right. I mean, because sometimes P waves look funky. We have a fifth, right? Right. A flutter. Yeah. Or yeah. you know the M shape. Right. So. <laughs> I want to pass this class. <laughs> you want me to give you a definitive answer? Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but if you notice here, every other beat is being dropped in this rhythm. So you have P, Q, R, S, T, P, nothing. P, Q, R, S, T, P, nothing. So every other beat is being dropped. Is yeah. the bass line usually crooked, or is that just happening? The baseline crooked? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, I see kind of it's going uphill. Yeah. Well, sometimes that happens depending on the machine that you have. Okay. I just didn't know if that was a definitive sign. They're heading toward heaven. But yeah, so, so be able to differentiate between a second degree type 1, second degree type 2. Type two. So number one is going, going, going. It's longer and longer until so one is dropped. Uh, it's not necessarily every third beat, but um, with a second degree type two, this is just a classic type two here. Just think about every other beat being dropped. Okay. And this is this is kind of key here. The PR interval is constant for each conducted QRS. So for each of these QRSs, the preceding PR interval, they're all the same. You see, in a second degree type one, they're different. So, because uh, this rhythm is usually it drops every other beat, if you have a normal uh, um, atrial rate, which is all the way up to 100, still your ventricular rate is only 50. So, um, some people with a rate of 50 will be okay, but some will not. But then again, like I said, if the atrial rate is 60, then the ventricular rate is 30. Most people will not be okay with a rate. That's just not enough cardiac output. So again, this is more dangerous than a type one, um, and because you just think about this being closer to a third degree block, so it uh, has more of a chance of becoming that. So a third degree block will follow this. It's the worst block. All right. We can give atropine for this. Uh, Rochelle probably would have assessed that it was bradycardia and she just gave matropine. Well, it's probably not going to help. It, it might, uh, but it's probably not going to help because the problem is not the atrial rate. It's the problem is getting the electricity from the, a, the SA node, the AV node. Atropine's not going to fix that problem. It might help, but probably not. But we can try. But treat the underlying cause. And this patient, especially if they are symptomatic, might need a temporary pacemaker and then may eventually need a permanent implant of pacemaker. For me, the one of the hardest rhythms to identify, and I don't know why, is a third degree block. Um, it would seem just by definition that it would be easy to identify because you talk about how it's just there's no discernible relationship between the atrium, atria and the and the ventricles. So basically, the atria and the ventricles are acting independently. The SA node and the AV node are just acting all alone. So the AV node say, I'm just going to be here, and the SA node is beating however it wants to. So there's no synchrony um, with the two nodes in the top and the bottom of the heart. So because of that, you don't have any synchrony here. You're going to have, most likely, some signs of decreased cardiac output. Your heart's beating very erratically. It's really difficult to match anything up here. because We always want to match a P with a QRS, right? Maybe this one made it, right? That one looks like maybe it made it, but 
that's so far apart that you can't even say that that P caused that QRS. You know, so they're they're so they're so far apart. Who knows what's going on here, right? Here we got an inverted T wave. Same thing over here. That looks like maybe there's a P wave just before that T wave. See, it's just all over the place. There's no communication between the SA node and the AG node. Because there is no communication, we call it a complete heart block. <coughs> what else? So it, it's it's likely, like I said, that this patient will have signs of decreased cardiac output. And of course, you're responsible for knowing all those signs of decreased cardiac output, which you likely know already. Um, but there you go. Um, your assessments will, will tell us about that. Again, the, the problem is not the rate here. The problem is the, the communication. So atropine probably will not help. This person often will have a low ventricular rate, um, but um, the atropine probably will not speed it up. What this person means, especially if they are symptomatic, is a pacemaker. This person needs a temporary pacemaker. We can do that transcutaneously from the skin with basically our, our pads that we hook up to our defibrillator. We can turn that into a pacemaker. Um, also, we can insert pacemaker wires into a central line directly into the heart. So we call it a pacing uh, line, basically. So this person needs to be paced. Realize that these medications, we would hold any medications that slow the heart rate. This rate's going to be slow, and the ventricular rate probably will be slow. We don't want to exacerbate it. Um, so, and you know, if they're on these antihypertensives that cause decreased rate, this person's probably going to have low cardiac output anyway and be hypotensive, so we're going to hold these there anyway, right? I think that PVCs are pretty easy to identify. A PVC usually lies within a fairly normal rhythm, uh, you know, some kind of sinus rhythm, a PVC will lie within that. Um, and it's just a wide, bizarre looking uh, QRS complex. Sometimes within the same rhythm, they'll look identical, and sometimes within the same rhythm, they'll look different. Like in this rhythm, they look different, right? So this is a PVCC, oh, that's wide, that wide QRS, See this really wide QRS. They just look, they're very discernible to me. You see a PVC and you pretty much know what it is. It's just a really wide beat. Um, when you have uh, PVCs that look the, look the same, we call those unifocal. And if you have a, a PVCs within a, a rhythm that look different, we call them multifocal. So this would, these would be multifocal PVCs because they look different. And that, the implication of that is that uh, the irritation or that that ectopic beat or that abnormality is coming from a different part of the heart. So if you wanted to say, well, which one is worse? I would say that a multivocal PVC is worse because more than one area of the heart is irritated. It's multi. Multi, because they look different. There's two different types here. And the multivocal with a positive deflection and a negative deflection. What if they look identical, but you have a positive and a negative? Would it still also be multifocal? Yeah, but within the same. This, this, yeah, but this is the same lead, though. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to give you two different leads to look at. So within the same lead, if you're looking at a 12 lead EKG and the patient has a PVC, just one, it's going to look different in every lead. But we're just assessing as nurses one lead at a time. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is probably lead two. So we've talked about a premature atrial contraction. It got started too soon. This is a premature ventricular contraction. The AV node jumped in too fast. Um, these are just terms that, that we might use. Um, but should actually, a singlet is one PVC. So then couplet, triplet, I think that you can figure that out any more than Three, we call it a short run of VTAC. So basically, if you if you know what VTAC is, that's a bunch of PVCs in a row. And I'll show you VTAC as well. The causes for PVCs are similar to the causes for PACs. 
PVCs are more ominous than a PAC. Beta blockers can help chronic PVCs kind of slow everything down so the ventricles don't jump in too quickly and cause a PVC. And as with anything, you know, we want to try to identify the underlying cause for this disorder. Any questions about PVCs? Can you go back to the slide prior? So what makes it a PVC is that it's it's just a wide QR race. Yeah. Sometimes you'll have a rhythm that has consistent wide QR races, but a PVC is usually thrown into. See, this underlying rhythm is looks like normal sinus rhythm, right? Right. So it's thrown into an underlying rhythm. But if you consistently have wide QRSs, uh, we wouldn't necessarily call that as PVCs. Maybe it's a patient, and maybe the patient is actually in DTAC. Is the corresponding T wave usually going to do basically the opposite of what the uh, well, you know, QRS you, does? You, you do notice that these that the T waves do look abnormal. See, this T wave is thrown way down here, and this T wave is somewhere, maybe right there. So right. they're going to look abnormal. Yeah. Well, but the whole the whole the whole beat there is going to look abnormal. Could it be possible that you have a, uh, a, nor a normal, other than it being widened, QRS one above? The, the baseline, yeah, and then it still have a T that's above the baseline. Let me see if I can think of what your question is asking. You see how the T wave inverts when uh, the QRS is normal right. and the fact that it's upright, but then when uh, when the QRS inverts, the T wave is normal and the fact that it's above the baseline. Is it always like that? So you're saying that the T wave is opposite of the QRS? Yes. Is it normally? It, it appears like from that? this rhythm that's what's happening. Okay. Um, I'll, I can never say oh. that. <laughs> you guys would love it. To try to, but look, if, if you see a PVC, you're going to see it. And, okay, that's a PVC. Okay. But you, you just don't make it look normal. Okay. Just look at a PVC. All right. That's all you need to do. All right. And. So, based, like I said, basically what VTAC is, is a lot of PVCs in a row. VTAC has been tricked into tachycardia. The rate's going to be very fast, and it's usually regular. And you see how these QRSs are wide. But they all look the same. They all look the same. Whereas with the PVC, they're all different. Right? Well, you can have unifocal PVCs, yeah. But a PVC is thrown into an underlying mm -hmm. rhythm. VTAC is the underlying rhythm. Okay. And those QRS that were upside down, what does it say on? Well, they're just widened and maybe inverted. Yeah. Does it depend on the length of the program? Yeah. Okay. This is probably lead two. Because the. Uh, the P QRS, I'm not sure if they're going up or if they're going down. Really, it doesn't matter. Okay. You look at it and you say that's VTAC. This is a rhythm that you will look at and immediately know what it is. What it says is VTAC. You don't have to measure anything. You took AC Lexington. Who's making sure? VTAC. The QRS rate here is, is always about 150. Is it one of it's the usually very high. Yep. But this is a rhythm. Don't overthink it, y'all. Be able to look at a strip and say, is that VTAC or is it not VTAC? Because if you have to think about it, your patient might die. Okay? So, <laughs> it's very true. So, um, you have no time to measure anything. Just, is it VTAC or not? So, VTAC is a rhythm that you should have to know immediately. All right? But that you will know immediately. We need to know that it's going on earlier. All right. Oh, wow. No. If I don't say it, you don't even know. Right. It's promise. All right. I think I said all that. We talked about you know three PVCs is a triplet, but anything more than three, four or more PVCs is what we call a short a run of VTAC. Sometimes patients will have five, six PVCs in a row. That's a short run of VTAC. That 
certainly bears watching, and we need to figure out why this patient is having a short one. But, but you have sustained and unsustained VTAC, and sustained means that this patient is in VTAC and they're not coming out of it. Non-sustained means they're coming in and out of it. But they will self-convert themselves back into a normal rhythm, hopefully. A normal rhythm or something different? Well, different. Yeah, hopefully a perfusion. So, one of the, obviously, if you assess that your patient is in VTAC, um, you, that means that you should be a battery chair in the nursing station, right? And you go into the room, right? So, if, you, if it's being inferred like, you know, something else, nah, whatever. But if you, take, you see that the patient having VTAC, you must get up and go into the room. But what would be your first action if you, if you if the monitor tells you that the patient's in VTAC? Check. Check. Is the patient awake? Right. Sometimes patients can be awake in VTAC. Sometimes VTAC can be perfusing. Not for a long time. I mean, we can't sit here in VTAC all day long. But the patient will, patient, our bodies compensate very well. Um, so the patient may still be alert in VTAC. Um, but this patient will eventually become not alert. Maybe they'll be refilled. But, um, so just don't get too excited until you've assessed your patient. Because the, the monitor is going to get really excited and make a whole lot of noise, and that's what's going to alert you to go assess the patient. So just keep your level of anxiety down until you actually assess that your patient is going to not have that same. So if your patient is not alert, you know, you certainly want to check the pulse, right? Because this patient could be pulseless. So if the patient is alert, here are some signs that they might report chest pain, heart palpitations, or fluttering. But then these are signs of decreased cardiac output, right? Low blood pressure, dizziness, syncope. Mm -hmm. So if the patient um, is um, still able to cognate and is awake with VTAC, we can um, give them an antipathic rhythmic and hopefully get them out of this rhythm. You know, even if they're coming in and out of it, they're probably going to order amiodarone. Lidocaine is an older antidysrhythmic. It's not used very much, but um, amiodarone is the antidysrhythmic that is usually used now. Right? Would you drip that or shoot it? Uh, what they did, they started it as a drip. Because if the patient is you know, still fairly alert, we're just starting to find a drip. Um, but of course, and it doesn't really matter what um, rhythm your patient is in, if your patient doesn't have a pulse, what do you do? Yeah. You start chest compressions and yell real loud. Okay. Um, so if the patient is pulseless and unstable, you begin CPR. And this is a rhythm that should be defibrillated as soon as possible. So after a round of CPR, we need to, or probably three rounds of CPR, we check and see if the patient can then be defibrillated. And that hopefully will get them back into a, a perfusing rhythm. Um, and and I, and I went through all this, but I'll go through quickly the ACLS algorithm, not in detail, um, so that you can know at least your first couple of steps if your patient is pulseless. All right. A lot of times magnesium and calcium and potassium, too, are culprits with these dysrhythmias, so these patients should be getting a BNP or a CNP at some point to see if we, if we corrected their calcium, they would just fix this whole problem, right? So treat the underlying cause. A lot of times electrolytes will cause this problem. Electrolyte imbalances. So um, this is a very bad rhythm. Um, this is the fib. We talk about AFib. Um, so that's where the atria were fibrillating. Here is where the ventricles are fibrillating. So if your ventricles are fibrillating, what is not happening? Perfusion. So I said with VTAC, the patient may maintain alertness for a point of time, but a patient in VFib cannot be alert. It's not, they're not going to be confusing. There's two different types of VFib. We, we call it coarse VFib and fine VFib. Coarse VFib, I just think about it as they just have higher waves. Um, this probably would be considered, this is a hard one to dis distinguish between, but 
This is probably coarse V2. Um, fine V2, the, the waves are not as high. Another rhythm that you should immediately be able to look at and identify, because if you can't, your patient will die. Okay? I said earlier that V TAC can lead to V fib. Um, let's see. So no cardiac output here. The patient's ventricles are simply fibrillating, not squeezing at all. So the patient will not have any cardiac output. So because this patient is pulseless, what do you do? You start to yell, yell real loud, right? Here are some causes. Uh, again, we could have electrolyte disturbances, uh, alterations in temperature. We could have medications that are causing this problem. The patient could have had just had a heart attack. Lots of the heart muscles are beginning to die, and uh, the patient may go into the fib. How is that feel? Someone's starting to go into the fib before they lose consciousness. Is that like a very painful thing, or just a, it comes out? Well, quick? I can only make an assumption, and I would assume that they probably feel impending doom, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, a lot of uh, a patient's not going to go from totally alert and normal to be fib. It happens not very often, unless you're electrocuted or something like that. Um, but I think that the, the, the pain of the shock of the electrocution would be more than the rhythm change. But yeah, I mean, because if this person, you know, acutely feels that their cardiac output is falling and you know, they're not being oxygenated, they're going to feel a sense of doom, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. That's why a person with PQ feels a doom, because they're not getting oxygen. Mm -hmm. so. And we'll talk more about a person who is hypoxic and how not to treat them. Because we have, our reaction is often to be quiet and lay down, you know. But um, <laughs> they're freaking out because they're hypoxic. So anyhow. So just remember that a patient in V-fib will not have a pulse. Write it down, all right? I think I've typed it in. Yes, might want to underline that. <clears throat> so we do our advanced cardiac life support uh, for this patient. What does the word asystole mean? No systole, right? No contraction. Systole, right, is actually the... Contraction of the ventricles, really. So, really, nothing or very little is happening here. So, this patient will, will certainly um, not have a pulse, right? Um, what's the first thing that you do when a patient is in asystole? Yeah. You check the monitor first, yeah. or check the patient, right? Because they might have pulled the leads off, right? And the machine's freaking out. Asystole, asystole. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you guys go, let's go the first thing you do is make sure that the patient really is in asystole. Okay? Um, a true asystole is usually not a flat line. It's usually got a few little bumps in it somewhere, um, maybe just little curves here and there, but there's certainly no, uh, no, really no activity. But just a flat, flat line, that patient's been dead a long time, or uh, the patient's on the line. So, but just make sure that your patient is not off the monitor first. And then, of course, if you assess that your patient is pulseless, you would do CPR if they have asystole. One thing that we do not do, did I say that we defibrillate V-fib? Yeah, you defibrillate V-fib. One thing that we don't do to asystole is shock it. There's nothing to shock. Now, you're going to read your textbook, Lamone and Burke um, had a brain fart or something, and they say to shock asystole. Well, it's a type. You do not shock asystole. I've seen people try to shock asystole, and I just laugh um, because nothing's going to, you, there's nothing to shock. Just think of it that way. There's no activity to shock back into our normal rhythm. We simply have to try to perfuse the patient with CPR, uh, and maybe we can get the rhythm started back as we treat the underlying cause. If a patient is asystolic, they're probably, probably going to die. So it's very, very rare that we get a patient back from Yes, ma'am. The point of the shock is not to start the heart, it's to stop the heart and hope that it restarts on its own. Yeah, so the, the point of the shock, yeah, so the point of the shock is to, to try to, com, to convert or reset the heart into a perfusing rhythm. Because, you know, that V-fib and V-tac are not going to be perfusing if we need to defibrillate. What if people yeah. know if it's fine V-fib or assistance? 
Oh, you, you'll be able to tell the difference between that. Because basically there's going to be almost nothing on this jerk. You know, um, you might have a bump here and there. But fine v fib you'll be able to, to see. Doesn't it always seem that they're shocking them back to life, right? I mean, well, what, what you see, what you see happen on TV is that you're always going to show a flat line. And it's going to go, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and that doesn't really happen. That noise doesn't happen anyway. It just means. Um, but um, and then they shock Aces, so and the patient comes back to life, starts breathing and talking. Right? Uh -huh. That doesn't happen either because by this time we would have intubated this patient um, and got some oxygen to their brain. Um, but anyhow, so. Uh, it's very important to remember the procedure for uh, BLS, for uh, CPR, how to do it, where to place your hands, how far to push, um, because you are responsible for all of that. So, you know, you might see that at some point. Um, so, if you, but if, if you simply remember to push hard and push fast, you'll probably do a good job. A person like Wendy is not the best person to do CPR, right? We would get Chris to do CPR. Right, so you pick the best person to do it as well, not a cake, right? Probably not, because you'd be standing on your tiptoes and you, know, <laughs> you weigh 110 pounds. You're not going to be able to, to push that patient's chest two inches into their heart, right? It's two inches now, right? Just two inches. You have to make sure that it completely recoils, so come all the way off and go back down. So if you don't know how fast to do it, what are the songs that you can sing in your head? Or Okay. So um, it is very important to, to finish those three cycles of CPR if that's what you need to do, um, and never to interrupt CPR for anything other than to uh, assess a rhythm or to establish an error. Or if you need to switch, but. That, that should be an extremely fast switch. Somebody should be standing right next to you and ready to take your, take your job. Another rhythm that is not good is PEA. What this, this stands for is pulseless electrical activity. This really could be almost any rhythm. Um, the patient could have normal sinus rhythm on the monitor, but the patient's heart is not perfusing. The heart is not pumping enough blood. The, the rhythm might look perfectly normal, but... Um, they're not perfusing. So the per a patient could be pulseless in normal sinus rhythm. So you see there where a lot of your clinical assessment skills will come in, right? Patient's in normal sinus rhythm, but I can't get them to wake up and they look real pale. Um, <laughs> let me check their pulse, right? And then you would begin CPR because it doesn't matter what's on the monitor. If the patient doesn't have a pulse, what do you do? CPR, right? Pulseless electrical activity. So here are some beautiful nursing diagnoses that might apply to these patients um, with these uh, cardiac dysrhythmias. And I think that you can understand why. Um, I enjoy nursing diagnoses questions um, like the patient has, here's what's going on, what's the most appropriate nursing diagnosis? Um, and if you just remember that you have to have a diagnosis and it related to um, and, uh, and also, I like to ask questions about uh, an appropriate nursing outcome for this problem. And also, also, always remember that an outcome must be what? Measurable. Not the patient will fit. Well, that's a nice, sweet outcome, but you have to have something that you can measure. The patient will do this, this, and this. Something that can be measured. So just to most of you, this is overwhelming, and that's okay. You don't have to memorize this chart. Um, you'll, you know, even if you have gone through an ACLX class, you still, I can guarantee you, are not competent to run code. Okay. Um, but what you need to know about this about this chart is how to read it, and really only how to read the top part, because really as it goes down, it's the same stuff over and over. But the point of, the, of it is, is that you start at the top, and the top of the chart says that the patient is, in, is pulseless. If your patient is pulseless, what do you do? Call for help and give CPR, right? 
the first thing you do. Not get the crash cart, not defibrillate, CPR. Okay? So the patient's pulses, what do you do? CPR and yell. After you get a monitor, then you can check their rhythm. And that's when you decide whether the patient should be shocked or not. So the, the unshockable rhythms are asystole and PEA, and the shockable rhythms are VFib and VTAC. That's what you need to know. Defibrillation, right? You defib, VFib, and VTAC, and you do not defib asystole and PEA. Because if the patient were in normal sinus rhythm, if we defibrillate that, we're probably going to put them into VFib. So just remember, these two we shock, those we don't. All right, so that's basically what you need to know in this chart. That, you know, as, as a new nurse, this is what you would be expected to do. The patient's pulseless, you start with some PR and yell as loud as you can. And you did your due diligence. Okay? You can't run a code by yourself. If you had to do one thing, it should be chest compressions. All right? It's the most important thing. So, all right? So that's what you need to know from that. But as we go along, you can follow this, and you can see, well, the patient was in VFib. We shocked, and then we immediately restarted CPR. And then after five cycles, we checked it again. They're still in VFib. We shock them again. And then, you know, and then, but we also give medications as we go. Like nephrine, maybe there's a um, We don't really give a lot of atropine. So is it on the VTAC supposed to shock when they pause, not on the response, right? Yeah, you don't want to defibrillate an awake patient. <laughs> <laughs> no, I make yeah. sure. They they would probably punch you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm not gonna ask you how many jewels to use. It depends on the machine that you have and, and all that yeah. stuff. Um, the best machines to have are the the biphasic and we just use basics. Is that isn't that right? Yeah. Okay. No, I said it backwards. Yeah, the monophasic is still six. All right. So just learn how to read it. But the most important thing for you to identify is just this top part. What do I do if? If you're in a situation like this where the patient is being coded, um, a, a prudent person would say, let's look at the H's and T's. So those are things that can likely be causes of this person's arrest. And they're down here on this algorithm. So the H's and the T's. So we can think, have, has, have any of these things happened that maybe we can um, correct quickly? All right. These things are very likely are hot at the top of the list of causing a person to become pulseless. We talked about pacemakers. Briefly, and the person that might need a pacemaker is um, a person that is in a block, right? So this is a permanent pacemaker, and I and I got an uh, an X-ray here that looks pretty good, but this obviously is battery operated, and it's in the the uh, the pulse generator is the big part. That's what's part that you can fill into the skin is called the pulse generator. And it's placed under the skin or under the muscle of the upper chest. This one's placed a little low, um, but also the, attached to the pulse generator are these, these, uh, pace, these uh, pacing leads. The, the pacemaker may have one or two leads. Um, this one is two, if you can see it. It's kind of hard, but if you follow this down, you can see one ends there and one ends there. So you have, um, the, you basically have an SA node, or one to control the atrias, atria, and one to control the ventricles. This is a, a dual lead pacemaker. But sometimes they'll just have a single lead pacemaker. Maybe it'll just be in just this top lead to stimulate that, and then the AV node will fire because of that lead. Right. So know how it's placed. It's put uh, on one or the other sides of the of the chest, I usually see it placed on the right, um, but but the leads are placed through the the uh, what is that the subclavian, right, and then go down into the superior vena cava 
and then into the heart. Right? So that's what's happened here. This is the vena cava, or the subclavian, the vena cava, and then it goes into the heart. So you know how it's where those wires are. So the, the battery in these devices can last a long time. I think with the technology now, I mean, I think that they're lasting more like 10 and 15 years, rather than 5 to 10. Um, I won't get real detailed with this because it gets a little confusing, but I'll just tell you what you need to know. That, um, that, the, that the pacemaker senses electrical activity as well. And the, the, you may need to have a sensing circuit so that the pacemaker needs, so that the pacemaker knows whether it needs to work or not, right? So that it receives information through those sense, the sensing circuit. Um, and the timing is how often the electrical activity is being put out, okay? And the output circuits deliver the electricity. There's two types of pacemakers. There's a synchronous and an asynchronous pacemaker. So a synchronous pacemaker is is also called a demand pacemaker. And it's, it only kicks in when, when needed. So that sensing circuit is going to continuously assess the patient's heart rate. Um, and that pacemaker will have be set at a minimum of maybe 60 or 70 beats per minute. If the patient's natural rate drops below that set rate, it will kick in and fire and say, oh, you need an extra beat. We need to keep you above 60 or 70, whatever it's set at. Use it 60 or 70. You can also have a, an asynchronous or a non-demand or a fixed rate pacemaker. And this pacemaker is going to deliver a set amount of uh, electrical conductions no matter what. Right. This might be the patient that has had a complete ablation or something like that. It's going to deliver um, those number of um, impulses no matter what. So no matter what the heart's doing on its own, it's going to do it regardless. Does that make sense? So you just know how the heart communicates with the pacemaker, those different pacemakers. This one, it doesn't communicate with it, right? But with the demand pacemaker, it does communicate with the heart. It only fires if necessary. I think I already said all this. Right? That's the function of the leads. So they sense and deliver. They sense the rate, but also deliver electricity if necessary. We talked about these blocks. Um, the patient is in chronic symptomatic bradycardia, which could fall under the sixth sinus syndrome. The patient in AFib may need one as well. This is interesting. You don't necessarily need to know it, but uh, chronotropic incompetence means that a person, their sympathetic nervous system doesn't stimulate their heart to speed up when it needs to like when there's exercise or stress. So for some reason, the heart doesn't speed up when we need it to, um, and that's a problem. Long QT syndrome is a type of block. So it's, it's a prolonged QT interval, so it is another type of block. Sometimes this long QT is caused by medications. We talked about the insertion of a pacemaker, at least where it is, how it's put in, how it travels through the subclavian into the superior vena cava. But realize that this is a, a surgical sterile procedure. This patient needs to be consented and prepped and all of those normal things for a, for a surgery. Um, we said that the pulse generator, you know, is placed in that chest wall, usually, like I said, on the right. There's different types of cardiologists. We talk about the electricians and the plumbers. So this person is a, an electrician, so an electrophysiologist, um, and, and the, the, other, the other cardiologists are usually plumbers. They manage the, the plumbing, not the electricity of the CPU system, right? Hypertension, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the electrician might do that. Okay.
about a pacemaker, it's it's interesting. Um, initial, and of course, the physician will put it in, and um, as the patient comes back for follow-ups, uh, maybe the physician will check it the first time. Uh, but usually after that, it is a nurse who manages these pacemakers um, with with protocols and things like that. But it's really a lot of responsibility. You know, the, the patient will go in and into the office and. They don't see the physician, they see the nurse, and they sit down and the nurse places the device over their pacemaker as a magnet, magnetic type of thing, and it, and it gives that nurse lots and lots and lots of data. And the nurse can tweak and titrate and, and change these settings uh, based on what's been happening with the patient. So um, it's a pretty neat job, I think. It's very specialized, uh, but I think that it's, that, that it's really neat that uh, in that setting, an RN is given a lot of autonomy. It's something very serious. Uh, after the patient becomes very stable with with a pacemaker, um, I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but um, after the patient gets very stable with the pacemaker and doesn't need a lot of tweaking, they can self-monitor at home. So there's these devices that connect to the telephone, and they just lay it over their pacemaker, and they dial in and over the telephone somehow. I don't know how it works. Um, it, 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 it communicates through the phone. So, six cents, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but realize when, when, this, when this device is being placed into the patient that it is in the chest wall and it's close to the lungs and it's, and it's close to, and it's going into the heart. So you have risk to the heart and lungs. And of course, with any surgery, you have risk of bleeding, skin erosion, infection, and clots. And I would say that this, this, would, this procedure would, in, would have an even higher risk of clots because you're placing something into the heart into the vascular system. Um, so um, the pre-op care is just like any other pre-op uh, care, really. Um, the, what is, is um, specific to this is teaching about how the patient will need to move and not move after the procedure. So um, they should be doing range of motion exercises, but gentle range of motion exercises. general nursing care for intraoperative, uh, the intraoperative period. And again, like I said, you know, the, we, often I think what we try to do is to teach a patient post-op what they need to know when they go home. That's the wrong time to do it um, because this patient is probably so mildly sedated, uh, they're probably hurting, they're tired, they're not going to retain a lot of stuff. So here's the time for teaching. It's a pre-op. So when we're finished, you know, they're going to come in for a consultation visit. We're going to talk about this. They're going to see the physician. They're going to see the nurse. And that's when you say, okay, you know, after this, this is what you have to do. When you come in, I want you to do this. The time to teach is not after a procedure. Okay? Keep that in mind. Because you physically have had something placed inside of the heart, the patient becomes at risk for having some dysrhythmias, maybe some PVCs or something like that. I'll talk about how... PVCs are caused from maybe irritation of the heart, and that can be physical irritation. Something's inside of the heart that doesn't belong there, um, and it can cause a PVC. It irritates it and causes it to jump in too soon. The AD. Mm -hmm. So really, any complications? Complications might be what bleeding, infection. Um, you know, fever, things like that. We, I said that you would teach the patient to do gentle range of motion exercises with that arm, but they shouldn't be doing anything straight, just reaching over their head. They shouldn't be swimming, lifting anything heavy, probably lifting very little at all, if anything. Um, because initially when that pacemaker is put in, it's not stable. You know, it's, it's, it's secured where it needs to be. But, uh, you know, our muscles are very strong, and uh, we could dislodge, or, you know, the patient could dislodge that, those wires. So, about things, you know, especially about reaching over the head and lifting heavy objects. Eventually, the, pace, the pacemaker and the pacing wires become implanted into the tissue. So, uh, the tissue grows around them, and they become part of the tissue. Uh, but initially, they're not. So, they're just kind of sutured in there. And they, they, patient can pop those sutures and the pacing wires come out and then, you know, we're back to square one. So, educate your patient not to, to do that. I'll, you know, you, you probably heard that a patient shouldn't, you know, 
be around a microwave if they've had a pacemaker. You know, eh, um, you don't want to tell them to stand in front of anything electrical like a microwave. But being in the same room as a microwave is not an effective patient's pacemaker. Um, but I think just in general, you shouldn't stand right in front of a microwave, right? I mean, I don't want to get microwave. So, um, so, but basically, you know, I think that these, um, uh, we, we teach them to, to, to be cautious of electrical devices, but we shouldn't make them paranoid about it because it's very unlikely, you know, that you should, that they would have any interference. Right. So, um, in, initially, initially a patient should not have an MRI if they have a pacemaker. Um, after a period of time, they can have an MRI, especially based on, or, or and also based on, um, the manufacturer and what it's made out of. Because not all metal is magnetic, is it, attractive to a magnet. I think titanium is not. Um, so. But initially they, they were asked them not to do it, but after a while it becomes nice and implanted and it's not going to rip it out of their chest. Um, but it's probably, probably this is made from something that will not be attracted to a magnet. But initially, I think the period is usually about six months, and then they can have an MRI. What about mm -hmm. if you go through an airplane? Um, it's just an x-ray. Yeah. And they say that it's a really low dose of x-ray, I don't know if it's true. Um, <laughs> Because the, the, those x-rays actually don't penetrate all the way through the body. So they did, you wouldn't be able to see what's on the surface. But, um, but yeah, x-ray won't affect. I'm still wondering why we're not supposed to stand in front of the microwave, because you've got to stand there to say, hurry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and watch it. Make sure <laughs> 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 um, yeah, but it's just, you know, the microwaves and electrical activity, you know, I think several decades ago, um, the pacemakers could be affected by, by that. But the technology of both, Devices have changed, just like you know, back several years ago, just until probably about five years ago, the med wouldn't allow cell phones. Whatever, it doesn't affect anything. Uh, with the technology that we have now, nothing interferes. And probably before that, the only thing that would interfere would maybe be that little noise that you get. Have you ever heard the, from a cell phone, like on TV or something, on the radio? That's maybe all you got, um, but which is not going to hurt it. But but anyhow, so as technology advances, things don't interfere. As much. There's different manuf manufacturers for pacemakers. St. Jude, not the Children's, Ho Children's Hospital, but there's St. Jude manufacturer of medical devices, Medtronic. Um, so the patient should know who made their pacemaker because if there's an issue with it, they come into the ER, the physician is going to say, what kind of pacemaker do you have? And the patient hopefully will be able to say it's a Medtronic pacemaker. So therefore that physician is going to call Medtronic and say, come out here and take a look at my patient. You don't want St. Jude messing with the same the Medtronic pacemaker because it's not theirs. It's not they don't have the equipment to do anything to it, and it could mess it up. So, um, so the patient should also carry an ID card uh, to decrease the risk of any injury or problem with the wrong manipulation of a pacemaker. Uh, but there's probably other ways to figure out what it. Maybe you could X-ray and there might be some kind of identifying way to to see. Who manufactured it, but it's a lot easier. If, meanwhile, it just says Medtronic made my pacemaker. Okay, let me call Medtronic. You know, you don't have to do the intro. So, any questions about pacemakers? So this is the temp there's also, I mentioned a temporary pacemaker. Um, and, you know, the implanted kind obviously is permanent, um, but the temporary pacemaker is used in an acute situation where the patient needs to be paced because they have decreased cardiac output. So I said that, I mentioned it before, but we could use external pads, and those are the pads that we use to defibrillate and cardiac output. They can also pace. Um, and we can also place those wires through the, the central line to go into the heart to pace the patient. Um, the patient is not going to go home with this. The patient will likely be in the ICU with this. Um, and this is a terrible picture, but um, it's, this is the device that is connected to the machine that paces the patient, um, and these are the different circuits, the sensing, the timing, the output circuits. So we can adjust those based on how the patient is responding to it. And there will, there will be an order for where those should be set. Yes, ma'am. Is that just until the permanent can be those are Right, yeah. It, 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 until we can get the underlying cause resolved, the patient comes out of the block, or uh, until we get a permanent pacemaker.
So we've talked about shocking, and I haven't been real specific, but um, let's talk about the differences between cardioversion and defibrillation, if I can say it. Um, so with cardioversion, when you think about it, just think about a synchronized cardioversion. That's the, that's the, good, the right way to think about it. Um, the, the shock is given usually at a lower dose than with defibrillation. Defibrillation is usually given at a higher dose, meaning joules, the amount of electricity you're shocking the patient with. Um, and a synchronized cardioversion is given in conjunction with the QRS. So the shock is delivered at the Q, near the QRS. Because remember how we talked about the T wave and the ST segment, how those areas are very vulnerable? So if we were to, cardio, or to defibrillate a patient that was in a normal rhythm, it's likely not a normal rhythm, that was in maybe AFib or, or something like that. And we, in the electric, electricity hit in that vulnerable area, we might just put them into AFib. So this, the machine senses the, um, the QRS, and you, 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 when you push to deliver the shock, it gives it at exactly the right time. It's synchronized with the patient's rhythm so that we don't put them into So these are the rhythms that we would use cardioversion for. SVT, AFib, A flutter, or maybe stable VTAP. If the patient is awake, we could cardiovert them really in the fibrillate. Um, the patient needs to consent to this, especially if they are awake. Um, it's not nice to shock somebody without permission um, because it is it is not pleasant. Uh, generally, we give sedation and pain medication before we deliver a cardioversion um, because you're not going to be in an acute situation. I've got a cardioversion now. It can wait a few minutes, you know. Um, defibrillation, that's the situation. We have to do it now. Um, so um, another, another key thing here is that we nurses prefer not to, to cardiovert the patient. Because it's not extremely emergent, um, uh, we, and the physician is going to be the one that decides to do this anyway, not, not us nurses. So we let them deliver, deliver the shot. Because if anything happens, you know, that, synch that synchrony didn't work just right and the patient now is in V-fib, it's not my fault, it's the physician's. You know, like, it's not trying to put fault on anybody, but this is a pretty serious thing. So we let the person with the more training just like the karate massage, right? We just let them do it. All right. And again, we, we talked about this, you know, don't cardiovert if the, we, we think the patient's been in this rhythm for a fib or a flutter for more than 48 hours. <laughs> Defibrillation is given at a higher amount of, of joules, higher amount of electricity. And that shock is going to be delivered at any point because there's really no QRS to sync it to, especially if it's B fib. So we just charge it up and shock them. 90% of the time you're going to be using pads, but some units will still have paddles, um, which are which are more dangerous to use because you have a, a greater chance of still touching the patient as you defibrillate them, and you could get some electricity too. Um, so the, the pads are better because you can truly clear from the patient. So always remember that when the patient is being shocked, um, you should not be touching the patient or anything that is touching the patient. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm so careful that I don't even touch the IV pole. You know, I know it's only plastic too, but it's connected. To, but you know, I don't, I don't touch anything in the room when the patient's being shocked. So that's an important responsibility that before you deliver a shock. You tell everyone to stand clear. All right. I've seen a, a med student get shocked one time, um, and it wasn't fun. He had to go to the emergency room and get an EKG, and he was all right. But this could put you into a deadly rhythm if you get shocked. You know, so um, stay away. So if you hear somebody say clear, and you're doing chest compressions, get off that patient, right? And then immediately after that shock is delivered, you can resume chest compressions. All right. But don't get shocked. 
Um, yeah, so I, I put here, but just just know that if if you are you know a floor nurse or whatever, maybe you don't have ACLS, um, don't defibrillate a patient because chances are uh, you have never done it before. Maybe you haven't been trained how to do it, and you don't want to mess up because the machines you have to learn how to use them. Um, so, but in general, if you have ACLS, you can you can shock the patient, but if not, have someone else do it. Uh, because if you get to the point where a patient is being coded, you're going to have people rushing to your room anyway. So there's going to be an ICU nurse there or somebody that knows how to use the machine. So don't. The key, I think, is don't use the machine that you don't know how to use. All right. <clears throat> Some of our machines act as an AED as well. The ones that the med do. Um, we can either use it manually and look at the strip ourselves, look at the rhythm, or we can let the machine do it for us and you just push analyze, you know, and says shock advise, shock not advise. So anybody can do that. All right. What else? I think I said all that. So the patient needing defibrillation is very sick, right? I think that's where we agreed to stop. Right? How many slides do we have left? 20? Is that it? 20 pages. Oh. Which is it? 20 pages or 20 slides? 20 okay. pages. So we're about half finished. That's appropriate, right? It's the end of day three or four. You have questions? Um, I think on Tuesday I'll spend a little bit of time talking about um, test questions and things like that um, because you know it, it never fails that students always have problems with test questions in this course, um, and it's just because they're higher level questions. And we, so I just want to. Talk about the questions before you take the first test, so that you can, you know, think about not the things that I'm going to ask, but how I might ask them. Um, and the, you know, the, the bad thing is that a lot of your references, like these NCLEX review books, those that get you through about maybe second or third semester with the level of questions. Those, the level of questions in most of those books are not high level. So, um, so we'll, I'll talk about what that, what it means to, to answer a high level question, and how to identify a high level question. You're not going to take the test and try to identify it as high level or not. You're just going to, have to <laughs> answer the question. But as you're studying, you study a little bit differently for higher level questions because it's a lot of evaluation of treatment, not simply just knowing what to do. It's knowing how to know what you did was effective. Um, so you can see that that's a bit more advanced. Um, Are the prep U questions like that? I think that prep U is a little bit higher level than um, anything that I've seen. Can you bring or make like two or three examples of higher level questions? I certainly will. Yeah. Um, so and also I'll bring some some sample EKG strips next time and we'll take a look at them, see if you can identify them. Um, and now that we're finished with EKG rhythms. Um, I, I just want to make it clear that you're not, the cardiac test is not going to be an EKG test, okay? It's going to be a cardiac test. So um, what students always do, um, and I haven't exactly figured out why, is that students love to study how to evaluate EKGs. Okay, you know, um, but I, you, you, you might have one question, what is this, you know? That's a low level question. It's low level because you're just asking to dump knowledge at me. Um, I want to know if you know what to do about it. So I will give you a scenario. I might give you a strip and say this is what we're doing. How do you know that this treatment was effective? Or, or how, um, or what would you do next? Or something like that. Not just what's this rhythm? Because you understand that that's not a high level question. That's a knowledge based question, which is the lowest level question. So, um, certainly go through the rhythms that I've talked about. You're going to find that there are more rhythms out there, but these are the basics and this is what you need to know. I'm not going to try to trick you on this test. I'm going to give you things that are fairly straightforward and classic. Um, 
So just remember, this is not an EKG test. Okay, this is a cardio test. So only a portion of the test will be EKG related. Because I, because I, you know, around here and students are always studying and never felt the first part of the semester people have got that thing out looking trying to identify EKG rhythms. Saying, I'm not saying you're wasting your time, but don't spend all your time on that or you won't pass the test. All right. So that's only a small portion of all of this. When do you look? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well, I know the difference. I guess I should. <laughs> Maybe you both. <laughs> okay, so just remember that. I mean, study the EKG rhythms, but don't spend all of your time on it. Once you remember, know how to identify that rhythm, you're not finished. You have to say, how is this normally treated? How do these medications work? What are my nursing implications for this? You notice that I've talked about a lot of medications, but I didn't go into them in depth because, why? Well, you've already been taught these medications. Um, or you already learned these medications. So, and, and, and always, and I can see everybody's face in here, obviously. So, when I, when I say things like that, like, um, you've already had this information, people are like, whatever, you know. And, you know well, I don't care if the instructor that you had didn't lecture it well, you were still responsible for knowing the information. So it, it's, it's no excuse to me that Miss So-and-so didn't teach us very well. I don't care, you know. Um, I care that you know the information. So what you need to also do is go back and look at your beta blockers, go back and look at your calcium channel blockers, your ACE inhibitors. We'll talk more about ACE inhibitors when we get to CHF, but the medications that we've talked about, you're responsible for, okay? I talk about some and I, hi I highlight things like amiodarone, what it is, whatever, uh, 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 but things like that. So, all right. So if I mention it, you're responsible for it. I'm not going to ask you a question specifically on a beta blocker, maybe, but it will be in, around that. And you have to know a lot of information to answer the question. So that's the purpose of this class, right? To bring it all together. So um, you know, and it's not me being tough. It's just simply me being hopefully get you ready to pass the HESI defense. And you'll appreciate it later. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Did everybody, who, Brian's not here and who else is not here? Is that it? So just from Brian, and you get one of these sheets. Did everybody sign an extra sheet today that I forgot to give you last week? Yeah. All right. See you next time.